My name is Emily Chenever. I'm the CEO and Chief Bottle Washer here at Abor. So if I have not met you before, it's very nice to be in this room with you guys. Um, how many of you have already submitted an application to serve as a director? Awesome. <laughs> I'm here to convince a few more of you to do it. Um, but also just to give you a real sense of kind of how we operate, what our vision and mission is right now, and where I think we're headed from a strategic perspective. But um, as is the case, anytime I'm speaking, you're welcome to ask me questions. Vicki Harris on my team has been with this association for over 20 two years. Um, Vicki is, is a treasure, and especially when it comes to this process, because she really helps ensure that you as candidates get what you need, uh, and that you understand the process, that you feel confident as you're moving through it. So let's talk a little bit about what has happened maybe with the association over the last couple of years. We've had a touch of turmoil. There's a new face sitting in the corner office. She's pretty awesome. Um, we <laughs> went through a completely new uh, visioning session. We're, we're in a different position when it comes to what the North Star is for our MLS system and for our association. And you should know that as, as you strive to serve on this board, you'll be running two different entities. The truth is you'll actually be running four because we have a foundation and a political action committee as well. But the, we consider that the association and the MLS are two separate entities with two separate purpose and visions, um, and that they are pretty different. So it can be hard to wear the two hats. We ask you to wear one at one time. So when you're serving the association, you're serving the association with a fiduciary just to that entity. And when you're serving the MLS in that board meeting, you're serving the MLS with a fiduciary to that entity. The MLS is wholly owned by the association. It's our greatest asset, business asset. Clearly, from a financial perspective, it's our greatest asset, but it really is a piece of technology that we leverage to serve its purpose, not just to kick back to the association. I am um, personally really passionate about ensuring that the inherent value of the association is known to every one of our members, and that when I ask somebody what their favorite thing about ABOR is, they don't tell me transaction desk, because that's an MLS tool. Right? <laughs> Happens every single day. So, so that's, you know, that's important for us right now. We're really doubling down on what it means to be a part of an association, why that matters for you and your business, and helping more and more of our members understand that. We're also really doubling down on what the value of our MLS is. Um, there are you know, quite a few threats to that current structure within our industry at large right now. There's a lot happening on both fronts. It's an exciting time to be in leadership. So I thought I might just read to you those new vision statements and give you a sense of what, how we think about we being both me and my 55 plus staff members and our current leadership and volunteer base about how we think what our North Star is. Our vision statement on behalf of the association side of our business is to foster the most professional and engaged realtors in the nation. At one point, given that there's a new Toy Story coming out, we've all said, and beyond. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our vision statement with regards to the MLS is to be the best in class service provider through expansion and innovation. Those are bold statements, and they're big and hairy and audacious, and I love that. And my team loves that, and our board loves that. Because if our North Star is not far enough away from us that we're striving for something, then we're just doing the thing that we've always done. And that's not really acceptable for anybody on our team right now. So our vision statements um, lead up, roll, or roll down to buckets that uh, align our strategic initiatives within our strategic plans, and this is in your packet. These plans are not uh, are, are malleable to the extent that they accommodate evolution in our business and that we need to be flexible and nimble in the way that we approach our business every day, both as an association and an MLS. But we want, really, really, really want to try to stick within the confines of these plans because they're so newly adopted. So it's our goal to help integrate new board members into owning that vision statement with us, understanding these plans, and also making contributions that help us find our way through what this plan is going to mean over time. But um, I just I say that because maintaining continuity when you flip five seats every year is really tricky, right? You know, 
I might really understand what happened two years ago because I was in the room, but you might not understand that and might not buy it in the same way. And when I'm leading a, a staff and 13,000 members towards that North Star, I want us to keep as much continuity as I can because I think that stabilizes the organization. I also have to do that in a way that makes space for your ideas, your passions, your ingenuity, and, and allows for us to continue to evolve. So that, that's kind of the trick in this gig, is to both be flexible, also kind of maintain that continuity and focus. Um, any questions about our, our kind of our vision right now, or where I think we're headed, before I get into the nitty gritty of governance, a really hot topic? No. We're basically the most cutting edge and awesome association MLS in the country. I say that everywhere I go, and it's not about ego. It's truly because, as I said, in a room full of my counterparts at the National Association of Realtors Conference last week, I have the very best and brightest leadership in the country. I have leadership that is willing to allow us to be bold, that allows us to chase a North Star that's really, really far away. Um, and I have a staff team that enables us to make that change happen. So we've got really a good thing cooking here, and it would be a pleasure to have any one of you on that team. So from a governance perspective, let me talk a little bit about how we operate. And I think Ashley's going to do some of this as well. The board has one employee, and it's me right now. And I hope it continues to be me for the foreseeable future. Um, and by way of me, you also sort of through extension manage these, these 50 people. So I manage them directly, but you tell me what to do, and I delegate that down because I surely don't make everything that, that's good happen here. Um, you guys are, as board members, will give strategic direction. So sometimes people think that they're going to get on the board and make lots and lots of tactical changes. They're like, I cannot wait to like launch this program and build that committee and redline this document. And you can do those things. It is highly discouraged because the value of a board is strategic focus and vision. And I promise you that if you give us a clear vision, I've got the team that will make that happen for you in ways that you can't even imagine. But you have to give us the space to do that. So we try to keep the board thinking in a very high level, a very strategic level, giving that, you know, helping us correct, butt up against the guide, the guide rails, the guideposts, and ensure that we're achieving the vision that you guys share with us as a board. But then the staff tends to make those more tactical and operational decisions. We try to fully implement that vision for you in ways that we can do because we have continuity in our experience. We're touching more members than you are on a day-to-day -day basis, and we're doing that as professionals that have unique and individual expertise. So that's kind of, that's the relationship between us. Um, I really strongly consider my position to be one in partnership with this board. I recognize who I work for and you butter my bread as board members, but I think it's really important that we always be in lockstep, that we work very closely together, and that's how I've built my association career. I've worked for associations my whole life, um, and that's kind of weird, but I love you guys and really can't get away from you. So I've worked both for local associations, for the Texas Association of Realtors, then back to ABOR, and sort of wound my way up to this position, and I'm honored to be here. But I have always held the belief that we work in partnership and lockstep together, and that that's what makes us our strongest version of ourselves. Um, we operate under our bylaws first. So if you think about the foundation of our governance structure, your bylaws are your first level of this is how things operate. Then you have more prescriptive um, policies in your governance policies. Those give more detailed information about what I can do, what I cannot do, when I need to ask the, the board for guidance, and then how, what the expectations of a board member are and how you should operate in fulfilling your fiduciary duty to the organization. And then in the absence of any comment, we use Robert's rules of law and order as a backstop. Just, you know, if we're in a position that is not defined anywhere, anywhere, then we fall on Robert's rules. And we maintain a parliamentarian in all of our board meetings that helps us ensure that we're kind of operating in that manner. So your bylaws are approved and owned in partnership with your membership at large. 
As you guys know, we sought bylaws changes last year and really overhauled that document for the first time in many, many years. It got a fresh stroke, um, attorney's review. It's, it's much more cohesive than it used to be. And portions of it are dictated by the National Association of Realtors because we're in a chartered relationship with the Texas Association of Realtors and the National Association of Realtors. So while you're running ABOR Association, ABOR MLS, or Actress, you're doing so within a charter that is dictated by that national umbrella. Um, and then your policies are completely malleable and can be changed by the board itself. So they're meant to be a living document to some degree. They're being overhauled also. So we started with our bylaws. We're in the fi maybe final touches of our, <laughs> fingers crossed, of our policies <laughs> revisions. It's been a journey. Um, and, and then, but things change, you know? Sometimes you put a policy in place that made sense at the time, but something environmental changed for you, or you feel like you wanna pull back some decision-making authority, or you wanna give more away, or whatever it is. Um, so those policies kind of live with the board body. They're a place that, that come to accommodate those changes in the makeup of the board body, and that's a good thing. You don't wanna just tweak them for no reason, but you wanna have some flexibility in the way that you operate so that you're not feeling, you know, hamstringed by this governance structure that doesn't work and change the way that your business changes every day. So those are kind of the basics behind our governance structure. Bylaws are owned by the members. They're very difficult to change, but they are changeable. Policies are owned by the board. They dictate what I can do. They dictate what you can do. And they dictate generally how our volunteer structure is, is comprised. They also talk a little bit about what TAR and NAR directors do and just give you a sense of our overall governance structure. Um, and then, you know, we work in partnership and hopefully in harmony, most of the time we're in harmony, um, to achieve a vision that is big and bold and audacious because we want to push the envelope in the way that we serve 13,000 people. Does that make sense? Any questions about the governance structure? So if you've got a question and you're nervous about asking it here, ask it later and we'll talk offline. That's not a big deal. Um, yeah? I, I do want to probably comments. So, you know, a lot of times you know, people think, you know, board, it's like about free lunches, it's about you know, <laughs> parties or anything else, but, you know, when you get into the details, like when Emily's talking about the governance and bylaws and everything else, it's work, and you have to be familiar with it. I don't want to jump on anybody's section, but it doesn't sound, it probably doesn't sound as sexy as you may have thought it was when you walk into this door and into this room. It's <laughs> not. It's definitely not. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, um, you are encouraged to travel when you can and participate in industry conferences and bring back that information and service to your members. So there are some really great and fun things about your service here. We try to make it as a staff as fun as we can. Um, those meetings are long and they can be hard, but I have found that <laughs> with the folks that really dig in and, and, and give, you get back, right, with any, like any kind of service. Um, so we try to make it fun, but it's not as sexy as people sometimes think it is. Jill. But I will say that one thing that is very sexy is this new strategic plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, girl. This is amazing. <laughs> Take some time and geek out on it. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, you know, it was last year's baby. This year we'll have another one. But um, no, but I mean, it is, it's a big deal for us to have two separate vision statements, for us to have two clear uh, north stars with regard to our MLS and our association. What followed that was a complete change in our financial structure. Our operating budgets were split. Um, our staff structure to some point shifted to accommodate kind of that creating more separation between them. Yeah, and later we'll continue to do some more work on our corporate structure overall, but we have operationally, financially, and strategically split and flipped the organization. Um, and we did it in a year, which is a whole lot of change at one time. But now we feel like we're hitting our stride um, with regards to really being able to like fulfill that obligation as an association to our membership and fulfill our obligations as an MLS to our subscribers. So it's been worth it. Um, and those plans are definitely the backbone of where we think we're going. So thank you, Jill. So Vicki created a, a PowerPoint for me to speak to. She's really structured and I am not. So I'm gonna allow for
for you to have this PowerPoint, but I'm going to hit the highlights for you with regard to the process. For those of you who have already submitted, your application is in before the May 31st deadline. For those of you who have not, you should throw your name in the hat. What's the worst thing that's going to happen, right? And it, even if you feel like maybe later this is not the right process for you, you're going to gain something just from trying, I think. Um, and I want as many qualified and diverse people as we can get in the room. Um, I, we, we thrive when there's the right variety of voices, when there's the right mix of perspective, um, and the right mix of lenses through which each of you is going to view tough issues that we've got ahead of us. So I strongly encourage all of you to, to, to at least try and just see what happens, right? Um, so May 31st, the applications are going to close. Then the vetting committee gets really, really busy doing their work. They begin in June to kind of, they delegate out each candidate for, for full vetting, which includes calls to your references, review of your application and documentation, and then they come back together and share what each of them has learned about each of you. Um, and then they begin at the end of June into July to conduct the individual interviews. The Vicki? interviews are all scheduled, will be scheduled for June. 28. June 28th it is. We hope you're going to hold the date. <laughs> um, so you'll go through an individual interview, somewhat, usually close to 10 minutes. I'm going to come to you. Uh, 10 minutes or so. There's standardized questions that they ask, and they really just try to both get to know you and your experience, but also sort of gut check around how, what's your understanding of our vision, and how do you feel like you want to engage in that directly? Matt. June 28th or June 27th? 27th. 27th. Yeah, it's the 27th. It is the 27th. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a board director interviews on the 27th and then state director interviews on the 28th. Okay, yeah. yeah. So this, she has the 27th, this is correct, for a board directors. Got it. Okay. So by the end of July, the 31st specifically, a slate of candidates is going to move forward. Because there have been changes to our process, I want to talk through exactly what that looks like. Our bylaws call for what's called a double slate nomination. That means that up to two people per seat available can be moved forward because the leadership at that time wanted there to always be the need and call for a member election. So still vetted, still running through a nominating process, but by design enabling an election still, right? So on the 31st, a, up to a double slate, so up to 10 people will move forward, 10 names. Um, those people will end up on a ballot at a later date. Uh, then that triggers the opportunity for members to operate um, uh, what's called a petition and run from the floor. So if you did not get moved forward or if you chose not to be vetted and, and, and run through the nominating process at all, you can seek nomination by way of collecting signatures from your peers. There are some specific parameters to that that we can discuss offline and run directly from the floor. To be clear, we will delineate the difference between people who have run through the nominating process and those that have run by petition. I think it's important that the members have awareness around that and that there be transparency around who has done what. Not because I favor one, but because we should just be clear. Um, and then we will, the, weeks, uh, the week of September 16th through the 20th, open a voting platform. It's run by a third party like it has been the last two years. It's truly, truly off-site, which I like because I don't want us to have anything to do with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and then the results come in, and we call everybody and let them know, and we move forward. Um, and, you know, that has been a process that we have learned at ABOR. This is not the way that we used to nominate people, but it's been really rewarding. And this being the first year that we're operating with those seats being maintained by people who are in an election by design, I can tell you it's been great. You know, we had a fun, fresh crop of new directors who were excited to be there, who represented all kinds of interests, who dug right into the, you know, the mix of things, and it's been a super, super fun year, and I'm really confident that this process is going to continue to serve us well. So who asked questions about the what next, or the mechanism of how, hopefully, you will be elected to this board one day? 
Um, I will tell you, with regard to your references, you should pick people that actually know you, know that you have put your their, your na their name down, and will say nice things. <laughs> because <laughs> every one of them will be called. This is not like a job interview. We can ask all the questions. <laughs> right? Um, and I do think that being strategic about who you choose for that um, can give way to like adding extra flavor to who you are as a person, right? Like, you know, if you just, I don't know, choose people who really know you and choose different people that know you in different ways. Because I think that that's a nice way to really round out your candidacy and to really exhibit who you are, not just who you want them to think you are, right? Yeah, so be good about that. The candidate interviews are only 20 minutes each. And so the committee gets so much information from vetting you, <coughs> by calling your references. And um, so, so they, they have kind of a foundation of what they believe the candidate looks like. And then when you come in, you put the eyes in the cake. Okay. Take your time with your application. What you write does matter. If I recall, later we pull the answers and they appear as part of your bio. Actually, they fill out a director profile. They fill it out separately. So okay. So later, account. after, if you are one of those nominated, you need to take your time with what you complete because it will show to the membership before they vote. Robert? Yeah. One suggestion. Uh, sure. Uh, make sure you, you notify the people that you use the references. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. If, if for some reason you don't think they know your, uh, just send them your resume. Yeah. Because, you know, they don't have a lot of time when they call people on the phone about you, and that could be the difference between the up and down. So make sure you pick someone who knows your career, who is willing to vouch for you, be honestly. I mean, I have literally had people say, I'm not sure why they put that person down as a reference. So <laughs> I'm, not over, I'm not overstating. You really want to be strategic about that and be sure that they're on the same page as you about how awesome you're going to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. All right, cool. So that kind of sums up what I came to talk to you about. I'm um, truly willing to open the floor to any question that you have for me about ABOR generally or about this potential service. It's a great time to be here. Also happy to move forward if you guys don't have any questions. No? OK, well, I'll get to meet all of you. Those who move forward will do a Facebook Live interview with me. That was super fun last year. It gave me the, I, it was the first time I met, like Job and I had met in passing, but not that directly. And it, it was awesome to learn about the candidates in that way. Um, I think it's super fun. If it makes you nervous, I'll try not to make you nervous in that. And um, thank you. You know, thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to even have this conversation and consider serving. I really do think that we have the best association in MLS in the country, and I really want people who think that to be a part of our team. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.